Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. It's that time again. Got a great topic today to discuss. Lots of money from the federal government that's sitting out there just waiting for some great innovation and technology ideas. So we're going to have a real fun hour. So good afternoon. My name is Kelly Bearden. I'm the director of the CSU Bakersfield Small Business Development Center, and we will be hosting the webinar. Today I'm joined by Elizabeth Hamlin, who is producing the webinar for the SBDC, and then we'll introduce Martin Kleckner III as our speaker in just a few minutes. So a little bit about the SBDCs is that, no, oh, not that much though. A little bit about us is we're a program in all 50 states. There's a thousand centers across the country. In California, you'll find that we're part of the Central California SBDC region. Region. And Martin does a lot of work with the San Diego and LA regions, but we're part of the Central California region that goes from Mono County down to Kern to the east of Inyo County, which goes to the state of Nevada, and then out to the Pacific Ocean on, on the west side. So 14 counties, Central California. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, here at the CSU Bakersfield SBDC, we cover three counties, Kern, Inyo, and Mono. We do realize that that is a large swath of California and we do our best to cover it. Webinars help do that by providing training throughout all the rural areas in this particular area. So at the SBDC, what do we do is uh, we do mostly high quality consulting to uh, existing business owners and those wanting to start a business. We're gold on a couple of different areas. One is business starts and, and we also have our number of clients. But also really that's important to us being in a large part of the San Joaquin Valley or the jobs created and retain goal and also our capital infusion and that is getting money to entrepreneurs to help them either start or grow their existing businesses. So today's topic kind of works along that lines of capital infusion and getting that capital. You'll see this is a couple slides of the last uh, four years of our existence in those particular areas of where we've exceeded our goals quite well. And one of the reasons uh, we exceed that goal quite well is our fine consulting team. Our senior level consultants, a group of senior yet very energetic and very experienced individuals <coughs> coupled with our associate or junior consultants, which are generally students at CSU Bakersfield that are in the School of Business and Public Administration. And combined, they make a great team. If you'd like more information, go to our website, csubsbdc.com, and also to sign up for services if you would like some of the high quality, no fee, one-on-one -on -one consulting. So uh, Webinar Wednesday, our next one coming up is going to be lines of credits for small businesses. And that's going to be two weeks from today on March 20th. Uh, we're gonna be hitting about the 100 webinars since 2013 relatively soon and expect a great big huge party for that, I'm sure. So some tips in, in order for you to get the maximum benefit is Number one is that uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards if you would like to review it at a later time or if you know somebody who would like to see it as well, uh, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. Oftentimes our slides are made available by the presenter. We can send those to you in a handout PDF and all you have to do is go to the survey at the end of today's webinar and mention that you would like a copy of the handouts. So this, uh, we're using the Zoom platform. Uh, it works well with mobile applications. And if you have questions for today's webinar, please submit those. And we might even pop in a poll in a couple minutes. So again, please ask questions. All of our attendees are going to be muted. And also the survey at the end and the handouts that we had just discussed. So that brings us to today's webinar, the two and a half billion dollars that's out there from the federal government each year that us in the Central California region get very, very little of. And we're here to try to make that, uh, make that history and actually change what's gone on in the past. 
And presenting for us today is going to be Martin Kleckner. Dr. Kleckner has 29 years of experience in senior level operations in business and economic development, public policy, in the life sciences, healthcare, energy sectors, and also the entertainment industry. Uh, he's advised over 100 emerging and established business on a variety of different issues, including commercialization, public policy, and has founded five startups himself. He is an NSF I Corps adjunct faculty for universities throughout the US, senior advisor for the University of San Diego Innovation Institute, which hosts the Brink Small Business Development Center, and the UC California Riverside Epic SBDC. Mainly, though, Martin's clients have won over 50 million of SBIR grants and private equity investments during the last three years. Martin, thank you for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. And Kelly, I really appreciate you using my high school photograph, by the way, for the introduction. That, that <laughs> helps a great deal. Much appreciated. So um, it, it, it's good that we have a, a fairly decent feel on your experience and your background on SBIR and STTR. And um, I look forward to chatting with you. And uh, I uh, am actually giving a basics introduction here, by the way, because I, I think that's the most important part is, uh, is Q&A at the tail end. So I've got uh, a timepiece uh, beside me to uh, keep track of me because I'd like to spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes, whatever works best for everybody to uh, actually talk about what you are interested in discussing rather than what I think that you might be interested in. So anyway, this is where I'm coming from. And the only thing that this really shows, quite frankly, is that I'm a gray hair and I've been around the block a couple of times. Um, I do serve as, as adjunct, uh, adjunct faculty for the National Science Foundation, which is one of the 11 agencies that offers SBIR and STTR grants. Uh, I have launched of uh, uh, four, um, uh, five, uh, six ventures and had two liquidity events uh, and um, ranging anywhere from Regenomed, uh, which is uh, where we engineer human, human livers for drug discovery purposes and in Silico Med is where we have software that simulates the human heart. Uh, Spy Finder is uh, one of my least favorite, but it's a hidden camera locator. And the only claim of fame there is that we got our 30 minutes of fame on CSI Miami to catch a couple of bad guys. Other than that, I have absolutely nothing whatsoever to brag about. Um, Selflex, uh, Selflex is a chest tube insertion device. Reflex MD has to do with Gordon Reflex. And AcuDava has been um, stated by the National Cancer Institute is actually being a major paradigm changer relative to the identification of people who have already been diagnosed and whether or not they're resistant or refractory to platinum-based chemotherapy. So the NCI is very, very excited about that. I've also been involved in 501c3 and uh, uh, have uh, participated in a myriad of uh, phase one and phase two with those agencies there plus Department of Transportation, uh, and so on. So ballpark $53.8 million in grants uh, and capital awarded over the past several years. And so we're starting to get our act together. Let me just put it that way. So that, what that really tells, uh, tells everybody is that, there we go, is that I'm, I'm never gonna claim to be an expert. I'll, I'll just simply claim that I have some experiences that I, that I hope that I can share a good portion of where maybe some of it will be of interest to you. So these are the topics that we're going to spend some time on at a, at a very high level, quite frankly. And uh, I'm also going to be spending some time on what I think are the key lessons learned from experience that I'm hoping will be beneficial to you and something that you should probably uh, pay a great deal of attention to. But these will be the topics that we're going to take a look at. But anyway, for those of you who have not uh, participated in an SBIR or not that familiar, there are two of them, as uh, Elizabeth had already mentioned, SBIR, which has been around for about 37 years now. And the STTR, which, span, which uh, stands for Small Business Technology Transfer, 
uh, been around for 27 years. And as you can see there, uh, each of the agencies that participate in this program, they are allocated by Congress on an annual basis, a specific amount of money dedicated to research. And of that research, 3.2% uh, is allocated, earmarked toward people just like you and me. And for the small business technology transfer, 0.5% uh, of their uh, funds are allocated for us. The distinguishing characteristic of the two is that all 11 agencies are those with research budgets of over $100 million. Only five agencies have research budgets over $1 billion. So the 0.45% actually gets you to a high dollar amount than what would uh, otherwise be uh, uh, considered, uh, I would think for most of us as being a, a comparatively small amount. Okay, and the, uh, uh, the other major difference is that for the uh, small business technology transfer, we are required to work in concert with a not-for-profit institution such as a research university or a, or a federal lab or another not-for-profit research center. All right. Um, now, we almost had some good news here where Gene Shaheen, a Democrat, a senator from New Hampshire, had um, brought a bill forward back in 2016 that was actually gonna raise those percentages substantially. Um, and uh, however, that net bill is now dormant and it's pretty much looking like this right now. For those of you who have been paying attention to the news, we've had some uh, government shutdowns, we've had some other issues. And so the, the congressional budget uh, generally has been uh, tantamount to continuing resolutions where the budget just simply continue from what they have previously been without any material changes, say for a few maybe in the Department of Defense and National Institutes of Health and so forth. So we are staying at 3.2% at uh, SBIR and we're staying at 0.45% of the total budgets. And I'm gonna share with you what those total budgets amount are uh, pretty, um, uh, um, pretty soon. So anyway, we've got 11 agencies. There's actually 12 if you count Department of Commerce, um, which is the, um, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology and the, and the other uh, component of the Department of Commerce is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as well. So uh, it, it's actually truly 12, but I've consolidated commerce to make it down to 11 agencies and so there they are they are the logos are, are are displayed for you the target audience for sbir as opposed to basic research is that these are opportunities that are going to transition over the so-called valley of death um, or across the chasm into something that is sustainable lucrative will have a major impact on the, uh, the, the economy, will create jobs, and lest we forget, it will also generate, uh, hopefully increases in taxes that will go back to Washington, D.C. So there is a very, very heavy emphasis on commercialization and so forth. And we'll also chat about that a little bit further. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, phase one pertains to feasibility and proof of concept. And uh, I'm probably being unfair here, but what they're really doing is testing the waters in terms of whether or not people like you and me can actually handle a comparatively small amount of money. Um, and the $75,000, $150,000 that you see right now uh, can actually, due to a, an SBA authorized, Small Business Administration authorized a hard cap waiver, which actually can raise those amounts to $225,000. It depends upon the agency, but I can tell you that with some agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health, I've had various phase ones go up to as high as uh, $300,000. So it depends upon the merit of the opportunity on that particular case. And the same goes, uh, quite frankly, for phase two, where we are focusing on efficacy. Once we've determined that the technology that we're looking at testing in a, more, in a deeper dive basis uh, is the right vehicle that will enable us to do uh, more extensive efficacy, 
uh, we can actually uh, get up to a much higher amount, sometimes as high as $2.25 million and change as well, again, depending upon the merits of the case. There are two agencies, the National Institute of Health and the Department of Energy, which as you may surmise, can be very, very comprehensive, comprehensive and very capital intensive projects. So we have an opportunity for both of those agencies for what are called sequential funding, which means there is a phase 2A and there's also a phase 2B, uh, which uh, may afford us an opportunity of getting upward in phase 2 to anywhere uh, between $4.5 million or even as high as $5 million as well. So that can be uh, a fairly significant amount to carry us through several years of very, very comprehensive and complicated research in order to get closer to uh, either licensing our technology or um, at transitioning it into the marketplace overall. I mentioned also special and supplemental funding because sometimes these agencies and others may try to attract additional interest in a topic. And I know the Department of Energy has done this extensively uh, in areas, uh, for example, smart buildings, where they're trying to talk universities to be, uh, become much more involved. So sometimes they will offer special or supplemental funding above and beyond what is offered in the funding opportunity to motivate them to get involved with us, to work in concert with us on our project. So. Um, we'll chat a little bit about that further as well. We're not funded for the most part on phase two, which is the commercialization part, but we are provided with uh, extensive and numerous partnerships and consultancies and so forth, with the exception of the Department of Defense, which actually will provide us with additional capital. But again, uh, for those of you who are aware of that, Department of Defense are mostly contracts rather than grants. So the phase three funding that comes through the Department of Defense is expressly to pay us to perform work for them once we have successfully um, meeting our deliverables for phase one and, uh, and phase two. So we got to be for profit and we have to be based in the United States. And I don't know if it's applicable to, to, to you, but none of my startups have been anywhere near 500 employees. So they're pretty magnanimous in terms of the definition of, a, of what's called a small business concern. We do for an SBIR have to be directly owned by at least 50.1% by one or more permanent residents or resident aliens. And the definition of a resident alien is either green card or residency, which means that over the past three years, including our current year, we have to have resided in the United States and worked and contributed to the economy for a minimum of 183 days. Likewise is the same requirement for any business partner that we work in concert with, form an alliance or a partnership or a joint venture. One third of the funds have to go to or may be subcontracted out. So if it's $150,000, one third ballpark might be $50,000 that we can subcontract out to a, uh, a specialist or an expert in a certain area who would fulfill a key role in the project. The principal investor part of all this, 50% employed by us, that's actually kind of a misnomer. They don't really need to be an employee. They really need to be treated or can be treated as if they were a 1099 and they only need to be involved in the project at greater than 50% at the inception or the commencement of the project through the completion of the last deliverable. Other than that, they are not required to be employees or related with our companies at, at uh, any point in time. Although, based upon the relationship and the success of the project, we, uh, we may fall in love with each other and, and quite frankly, uh, maybe want to have them uh, join our firm on a more permanent basis. A little bit more complicated on the SPTR, the Small Business Technology Transfer component. We still have to be for profit. We still have to be based in the US. We still have to have less than or equal to 500 employees. Um, we do, however, need to be working in collaboration with a 
um, a not profit, non not for profit college or a university, or a research institution or a federal lab. Uh, another complicated area here is that since we were, are going to be working in collaboration with the university as part of the proposal, we do have to have a formal in, uh, intellectual property or patent sharing agreement uh, with them before we uh, get allocated the funds. Um, so we still need to perform somewhere in an STTR anywhere between 40 and 70 and the part of the university or otherwise needs to do 30 to 60. But that also means that if we do just 40 and the not-for-profit part of does 30, we're still able to deploy about 30% of the funds for outside contractors as well. And as opposed to the SBIR, our principal investigator in this case does not need to be a 1099 or otherwise with our own small business concern. And typically that ends up being an expert or research from the, uh, from the university or the not-for-profit research institute. We also have uh, other areas where cross-program awards, what that means is that uh, we can start out uh, in phase one as an SBIR, uh, we can do phase two as an STTR, or conversely, we can start out as an STTR, and sometimes that happens a lot. I've worked on various projects where we may need extensive expertise from a a key research institution, but since they take so much off the top for themselves, for their expertise, the facilities, and everything else they provide, we may opt to flip in phase two into an SBIR, and that is indeed doable. We can also flip from one agency to another. Rare is the case that I have ever done that, but what that means is that if we get a phase one by uh, through the National Science Foundation, we can flip into the NIH for phase two or conversely or, or some other area. The good news, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that we are back to direct to phase two. The definition of direct to phase two means that if we've done phase one equivalent or comparable work that would qualify as a phase one project, we don't need to repeat that. Whatever we may have done already could prospectively qualify as a proof of concept or feasibility, so then we can go directly into a phase two project. We have to, of course, defend that. It started out as a pilot um, and went for five years and then was caught off for a while, but uh, uh, Matt Portnoy, who is the lead program officer for the National Institutes of Health and the others, had indicated that direct to phase two has been reinstated starting to 2019, and so that's good news for some people. I will say, however, that rarely do I recommend direct to phase two un un unless I am absolutely warm and fuzzy, comfortable that you have done what needs to be done to be comparable and acceptable to the agencies as having performed phase one equivalent work. As opposed to in the past, all of us who have been awarded a phase one we are allowed to now apply for phase two. It's not, not based upon where it was historically to how well they thought that we performed in phase one. And then, as I had mentioned, the, um, uh, the NIH and the Department of uh, Energy um, have, uh, due to high complexity and high capital requirements, they have what are called phase 2A and phase 2B. That's the $4.55 million dollar. Um, amount of money that we may prospectively be able to uh, secure, um, depending, depending upon the, the merits and the complexity of the case. We've got something that actually was a, a problem that occurred most for the most part in the uh, 1990s and the early to mid 2000s, where there were many firms who were specializing their entire business model of just simply getting phase one awards and uh, no, not generating any form of revenue at all, as all, at all. So the agencies lost their sense of humor on that. And so there are two performance bench, benchmarks. And I really don't think that much of this is really going to be applicable to us. But uh, there are two terms and conditions now. Uh, the first one is that for any of us who have received over 20 phase one awards over the past five years, 
And, and I can tell you that rarely happens, quite frankly. That's kind of comparable to four phase one awards over uh, on, on a per year basis. 25% of those have to have been approved and transitioned into phase two. So that's one requirement. Uh, the second one has to do with, for those of us who have been awarded 15 or 16 or more, more than 15 phase two awards over the past 10 fiscal years, we have to have received uh, at least $100,000 of sales and or investments from a private equity firm or a corporate VC or corporate business development in the form of a strategic alliance, or we need to have had received a number of patents resulting from that work equal to 15% of the number of the phase two awards. So both of these benchmarks, quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, they're a comparable walk in the park. And uh, most of us, frankly, never reach those thresholds anyway to even reach that consideration. And if we do, on June 1 of every year, the SBA takes a look at everybody who has received an award uh, and does a calculation relative to both of those that I had shared with you. And if we have not received, um, uh, or, or they will not be able to give us a phase one award until we correct either one of those two metrics. So something that some of us need to pay attention to, most of us most likely, We'll never have to get to that threshold to have to pay attention to that anyway. And likewise is the case for those of us. It typically is in the area, again, of energy, uh, possibly NASA, uh, definitely in the National Institutes of Health where we're dealing with high capital intensive uh, life science applications and so forth. There are VC participation rules it's easier for them to be accepted in Department of Energy and National Institutes of Health projects, again, uh, due to complexity of the project and the high capital cost. The distinguishing characteristic here, however, is that no single VC firm, with one exception, can hold a majority share, also known as control over our firm. The only way that a VC or a hedge fund or a private equity firm uh, can be a majority shareholder is if they are owned by one or more U.S. citizens or permanent resident aliens. Otherwise, um, they can only be majority shareholders. So once again, I rarely um, uh, think that any of us are going to be reaching that point, but if, if we do, um, that's, that's the rule. Okay, so what about the STTR? Um, it's a little bit more complicated, and the reason why it's more complicated is that we have a partnership with a university, uh, or we have a partnership with a federal lab, or we've got an alliance with a not-for-profit research entity. Things get really hairy, things get very complicated, and so um, uh, no VC hedge fund or private equity funding is is permitted on under STTR. Um, projects, they have to come into play after the completion of our deliverables for phase two. So those are what the numbers look like right now. And as I mentioned, because of the continuing resolution, uh, these numbers have changed uh, uh, little, if at all, since 2017. So these are what the numbers kind of look like in terms of the amounts available. Um, no surprise to you, I'm sure the NIH, HHS, and, and Defense have the highest amount. Um, I may be a little bit off with the DOD and the National Science Foundation. I, in fact, I think I just saw that my math is off with the National Science Foundation. I think that dollar amount is a little bit north of that right now. But that's pretty much what the dollar amount looks like. And I can tell you that um, uh, two of my teams have pretty much um, rallied almost the entire $8 million of the Department of Transportation for autonomous vehicle projects. So here's where the interest is, and it is nowhere near complete or comprehensive. But this is the kind of areas where they have uh, indicated that they have a great deal of interest. And I'm not kidding about the asteroid ca capture part of that. Uh, uh, NASA is funding a technology. So if any of you are in that business, uh, we're looking for uh, your technology uh, to go up and lasso an asteroid so we can do some mineral mining and, and some water capture. So 
who would have thunk it? These are some of the projects that I have uh, helped fund in the past, and, and it's limited. Um, the I, I mentioned a couple of them already. And uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, any of you saw exotic bird stimulation down there, but that's absolutely for real. The National Science Foundation funded uh, the exotic bird stimulation. And the reason being is that the, uh, the birds from South America, parrots and uh, cockatiels and all of those are, uh, as, as some of you who may or may not own those birds, they are, my daughter would say, they are wicked smart, which means that if they are confined or unstimulated in a certain way, there could be some very, very serious problems there. So the National Science Foundation actually funded a project to a team out of the University of South Florida uh, to come up with a program to stimulate uh, hyper-intelligent exotic birds. So who would have thunk it? And I'm only joking about the asteroid mining part on the right side. I just kind of wish I had that project you know, only because what the heck, it might be fun. This is what the phase one success rates are generally looking like right now. So I don't know if any of you think that's either a good sign or a bad sign. But if I were to ask you, how would you compare SBIR or STTR success rates where uh, the success from your application might be anywhere from 10% up to ballpark 18, 19, or 20%, I'd ask, do you think that's a good deal or do you think that's a bad deal? And then I ask, well, what do you think the success rate is if you reached out for a private angel funding at this particular stage of your venture? Um, and the answer to that is somewhere between zero and 1%. So all things considered, this is the reason why SBIR, SBA is calling this now America's seed fund is because this is where, especially since the 2008, 2009 uh, Great Recession, this is where most of our seed, our seed funding is coming from anyway, uh, in, in lieu of angel funding. So what's important to them? Uh, and I only selected the, the four here because we have limited time, but let's take a peek at the Department of Energy first. And, um, okay, so I'm at, I'm at 30 minutes, but I, uh, but I think I'm almost done here. So the Department of Energy, um, you're gonna find uh, with all, all of these agencies, all 11 of them, that they're looking for pretty much uh, the same type of indication of whether or not there is a reasonable chance of you being a, a successful project that they should uh, very, very seriously consider uh, investing in you. One is the technical approach, um, whether or not your study approach uh, um, has merit enough. Number two is whether it's innovative enough. Number, number three is, quite frankly, whether you uh, have the right stuff to actually create and manage the project and whether or not it has a substantial and significant public benefit and impact. The NIH is the only one of the agencies that actually does a scoring process. And the, the six over there are actually criteria that the reviewers are held accountable for in terms of evaluating each one of the sections there that you see in the box with the, with the, um, uh, the red uh, titles of the segments. Title actually and abstract, believe it or not, are very important areas that they said great store by. Because if I was gonna ask you how was the normal behavior of a reviewer when they take a look at a proposal of yours, they do look at the title first, they read the abstract secondly, and the third area that they take a look at, even before they get into the main body of her proposal, your project description, is that they will go down to the biographies to see who exactly is submitting the proposal in the first place. So they are held accountable to grade each section of the proposal based upon the five criteria there, with the exception of overall impact. Overall impact is not the sum of the first five. And the same story goes for the Department of Defense. And even though we may think, well, gee, Martin, isn't this a contract? It is a contract to a certain limited extent to meet their needs, but now they are holding us accountable also to go above and beyond outside of the Department of Defense. So we need to demonstrate to them that we have a solid commercialization strategy to go out there into the civilian population. 
Now, I know you're looking at what might appear to you as invasion of the body snatchers, but the purpose of this graphic actually is to indicate to the sharing of knowledge. But the National Science Foundation, the same as the others, they're looking for a well-reasoned and high, uh, highly designed uh, study approach, research plan, whether or not you have the right stuff and whether or not it's gonna have a substantial benefit for society and whether or not it's creative, original, and transformative. So here's a look at a synopsis of all four of those agencies. And the columns may be a little bit longer for one for another, but if you look at it, you'll see that they're all pretty much asking for the same thing. They, they said, great store by the quality of this study approach, your research design, whether or not you have the right team, uh, and um, whether or not uh, you have the environment and the facilities to pull it off. They're all asking for essentially the same thing. Here are the areas, however, that I set great store by, and probably I spend a great deal of time uh, working on uh, making certain that you uh, have the most uh, optimal chances of, of winning the day. Many teams with whom I work do not have a complete team, especially for those of us who have never been trained in study approach before. I typically have to go out there and, and help you fortify your team and hardly anyone has ever had any opposition whatsoever in building that. By the way, think ahead to commercialization as well. And so even though your phase one project and phase two prospectively is performing research, you do need to demonstrate to them and display that you have commercialization business experts who are part of your team as well. You'll kill us for those of us who have not been trained for research design, uh, means that, uh, and I'm happy to do it, and I do it 65% of the time, if not greater, go out and find a collaborative partner with you who is uh, either a university researcher, professor, or uh, someone with the same skills uh, at a not-for-profit lab uh, in order to perform the study approach, which is absolutely critical. Uh, if we do not present with the credentials and the capability for designing and executing a solid study approach contain, uh, containing everything that you see before you, uh, our chances are anywhere between slim and none of getting an award. This is why at least 65% of every SBIR that I work on, um, I, uh, I will probably feel obliged, with your blessing and your permission, by the way, to go out and find uh, uh, a research partnership somewhere in a university throughout the United States. Um, Mostly important on phase two are the budgets. Phase ones are, uh, allow for what are called uh, firm fixed budgets, which means that we agree to a specific dollar amount, that's all that we get. Uh, the phase twos are a little bit more loosey-goosey, but not that much, uh, and they're called cost plus budgets, uh, which means that if there are any surprises or something that will compel us to change what we're going to be asking for from the agency. That's allowable to a limited extent. Really, really, really important that we demonstrate to them that we have an innovation that actually is sustainable, lucrative, and, and commercializable over the long term. And to that end, uh, especially with the Ni uh, National Science Foundation, for those, those of us who have been awarded and are successfully completing our phase two projects, uh, there are matching funds available. Thus, uh, as we are reaching our uh, completion of the final deliverables for phase two, uh, if we are now securing private equity funding from outside, they will match that up to $500,000. If we are also forming a strategic partnership or an alliance with another firm or a corporation who may help us answer unanswered uh, questions uh, that we have been working on um, and on the project, they will give us an additional 20% of the phase two award up to $150,000. And if we need someone to help us with business development and commercialization assistance, they will also give us $10,000. So all of this extra money is above and beyond what we would be receiving uh, with our phase two funding. They also offer extensive commercialization support 
Foresight Science and Technology out of Providence, Rhode Island, uh, gives every phase one awardee uh, a, a, a report that they produce on our behalf called the Technology Niche Analysis. Uh, and they also offer what is also uh, referred to as a commercialization plan. The um, NIH and National Science Foundation will offer phase two awardees uh, the provision of consultant firms to give us commercialization assistance, which includes mentorships, the production of reports, also guidance, uh, somewhat tantamount to incubator type and accelerator type support. There is also the i program, which we will not have too much time to delve into here, but if any of you are familiar with the Lean Launchpad method and the business model canvas, there is an opportunity for you to receive an extra grant totaling ballpark, give or take $50,000 to participate in a highly, highly competitive and rigorous program called i -Core, Innovation Core. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, facilitates uh, us going through uh, the entire United States to what's called a discovery and validation process. And then again, there are the supplemental funds uh, as well. Okay, um, and uh, so this is LARDA. For any of you who are coming to the University of California Riverside next Tuesday, LARDA is gonna be giving a presentation on this particular program. Don Breaker is an exceptional firm. Larda, by the way, is located out of Los Angeles. Uh, Don Breaker is out of Denver, Colorado, and uh, they are retained by several agencies uh, to uh, provide uh, mentorship and guidance as well, and a very, very comprehensive commercialization readiness assessment or commercialization plan as well. These are extremely helpful uh, and vital uh, documents and mentorship support, which will actually help us be that much more successful as we um, submit our proposal for phase two. NIH, DOD, and the National Science Foundation have what are called the Innovation Core again, and that is the comprehensive seven to eight week, highly, highly intensive customer development cover discovery and validation programs, which uh, we'll be able to go over at a later time if, if you're interested. Uh, rejected? Um, sure. Uh, there are numerous reasons why our phase one proposal is rejected. And that happens a lot, but I wouldn't consider that to be a deal, deal killer. The, uh, the date they don't get it part of it, that's kind of like a flippant comment, quite frankly, where um, if they don't get it, it really is our fault. It's not their fault. So uh, the onus is on us in, to communicate to them our innovation and why it's going to have public benefit and why our study approach will get us to the, uh, the promised land. Everything else are primary reasons on why we probably may not get phase one funded. Um, and again, uh, keep in mind that even though these are very intense research projects, they are every bit as much as, much as, a, uh, as being a sales document as well. So they have to be very, very clearly written. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, um, I, I mandate that every proposal is written at an eighth grade to sixth grade level uh, of writing. Uh, not everyone is going to be motivated by something that is so highly esoteric that only a fellow PhD might, might be able to comprehend what the project is all about. So it's got to be innovative, of course, and the team absolutely has all that needs to have the background, the experience, uh, um, the credibility and the credentials to be trusted by the agency and the reviewers to uh, invest their funds wisely. Significant problem and uh, study approach, quite frankly, is probably one of the biggest areas uh, where I have to get involved directly in terms of making certain that the research design and how it's executed is, is managed correctly. So anyway, uh, lack of, uh, of evidence for innovation, sustainable value is always an issue. Uh, this is something down below that I set great store by, and that is, um, look, these are very complicated proposals, and these reviewers may not necessarily be that up to speed in terms of the market receptiveness to the project that you're proposing. So getting carefully written letters from prospective customers, prospective investors, prospective strategic partners who are not necessarily 
committing per se, but they are offering letters of endorsement, letters of support that basically state that if you achieve every aim that you achieve in your proposed innovation, they will be first in line, elbows flailing to be your first customer or your strategic partner. And then finally, this may be a bugaboo. This takes about six to eight weeks, but it's critically important. Uh, depending upon the agency that we're submitting our proposal to, we do have to register. Now, there has been an issue of recent vintage past year where there has been some fraudulent activity uh, coming out of the countries of Nigeria and Ukraine and elsewhere, where funds that have been awarded have somehow some way been rerouted elsewhere rather than our own bank accounts, which of course is a, an enormous problem. So we do need to now register our company. I used to counsel that all we need to do is to be a sole proprietorship. We still can, but we do need to register with the state of California or wherever we want to register to get an EIN, an employee identification number or taxpayer IN through the DUNS. We do then have to register on system for award management, but in addition to that, we do need to get notarized and sent out to them a letter that indicates who is the principal lead director of the project. And then of course, grants.gov, ERA Commons, if you're with the NIH, and we do need to now register with the SBI registry. It takes six to eight weeks, it's not our fault, it's on their end where, um, um, uh, you know, they, they need to make certain that we are legit and authorized to receive our funding. So that's my 30,000 foot um, overview. And I know it hasn't done any justice to you whatsoever, except that it gives you a general, unspecific idea on what this is all about. These are ext extracts from what are typically a 14 to 15 hour uh, four series um, course that that i offer in san diego and uh, and elsewhere so anyway that's it so i'll hand it back over to kelly and elizabeth if we still have time for questions and i'll do my very best to answer them sure and uh that 14 hour class is something that we hope to bring to bakersfield in the san joaquin valley perhaps eastern kern county and other areas soon to get a portion of this 2.5 and Martin, let me put in a plug before we get to the questions for your yeah. event that you have next week, yes. next Tuesday. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing at UC Riverside. Sure. This is a full day conference where we are having five program officers, the lead program officers from the National Institutes of Health, from the National Science Foundation, from the Department of Defense, from the United States uh, Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Energy are all coming out to meet with us. And in addition to that, uh, I have brought in several program experts who are specialists in research design, one of them. Another one is a specialist in uh, commercialization. Uh, another two are specialists in i -Corps. And then another one is a specialist in all matters with regard to federal labs and Department of Defense. So it's a very robust, robust and exciting program. And it is an opportunity for those of you who are seriously contemplating uh, submitting a proposal to meet one-on-one face-to-face -on -one, -face with the program officers. Uh, to discuss your initiative, even if it's at a high level where you haven't gotten into specifics. Uh, we only have about 15 to 20 minutes per one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we probably have filled every one of those out, but I am getting some word that, uh, unfortunately, some of them may not be able to make it. So if any of you are, are up to the drive from Bakersfield down to see us at UC Riverside. It's a, um, it's a fantastic conference. We've got somewhere between 150 and 180 attendees right now uh, coming to see us. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a very, very educational. And I think you're gonna learn a lot. We also have lots of awardees who have agreed to come as well and to share some tips in terms of what they had learned, lessons learned, and what they think would be beneficial to us. 
to learn from them that might hopefully optimize or heighten our chances of uh, being successful with our SBIR application. So I, please, you know, I yeah, see the value. Yeah. I'm Sorry. going to be there. Absolutely. You know, my, my, and uh, hopefully we can bring this program back to the to Kern County and the San Joaquin Valley and East Kern as well. So hopefully we could do something of this magnitude locally and really jumpstart uh, SBIRs in our community. So Martin, we do have a we do have a handful of questions here and probably just about enough time to answer them. So fantastic. Let me start with the first one. Are are there successfully funded phase one applications online to review before writing one? Yes, there are. Uh, the agencies do have some that they can offer. And uh, so you can either get on their respective um, websites and they will offer samples of ones that might be helpful to you. I do have several severely, is it redacted or dedacted? I, I always get those two. Um, like, uh, Propri you know, to protect proprietary information, but I also have several that I am open to sharing and the proposals were open as long as I had um, you know, blocked out cer certain proprietary information. But I would suggest as your, first, uh, as your first attempt, get on their respective sites. Reach out to me if you need any help on that, by the way, um, and I can guide you to where they're located. A little bit related to that is, should I pay someone to write the grant or should I do it myself? I highly, 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 did I mention highly? Recommend that you do not pay someone to write your grant. Uh, this is something that I consider very, very important to me. You are the founder of your proposal. You need to be the one to write the grant. You need to be the one to write your commercialization plan. That being said, uh, it is okay to hire someone to be an editor, you know, to clean up, you know, and, and to make your writing style that much better. But I personally, and this is just a personal thing, and I do get pushback on this, by the way, but I personally and, and, and highly uh, propose that you do not hire someone to write your grant for you. That's really your job. And this, by the way, is why I get very, very, very closely involved with any of my clients in writing that grant. Um, I am sort of like your helicopter mom, where um, I uh, very, very carefully, multiple times, go over each section of your proposal and edit the living daylights out of it. Uh, don't pay for it. Okay. Martin, does it help to seek guidance from the agency funding the SBIR? Very much uh, in favor of that. Everyone with whom I work puts together what I call a single page statement of aims and a letter of intent or inquiry. And um, we send that out as soon as we possibly can. First of all, you would work with me to write out that statement of aims and you would work with me closely to write your letter of inquiry. We send that out and we set up a conference call uh, with uh, an identified program officer. Uh, I call this the, pro uh, the pollination process where they get to know us and they get a better feel on what your proposed transformative innovation is all about. So that's part of the process is as early as possible, uh, put together a document send it out to them by way of email and set up a conference call. And I typically get involved in that conference call in concert with you. Great. Hey, Joe has a question. His is, do these programs require shared ownership of IP? No. Great, no shared ownership. And another question is, uh, so there is no ownership that I need to give up or I don't have to re repay the money if I succeed in the grant? Uh, this, is, these, this is called non-dilutive funding. So the federal government has no right to your IP whatsoever. So um, as opposed to private equity, where of course you would need to start diluting yourself as you're uh, handing out equity stake, uh, to those who have invested in you. SBIR and STTR funds 
just like it is with the case with foundations, unless it's a venture philanthropy format, you give out zero equity in your firm. Okay, Lizzie has the last question here. It says, commercialization seems important. What is the key to successful commercialization plan? Well, there is a, um, a, a set of questions that they want you to answer. Um, I also have what's called a commercialization plan template uh, that I am only too delighted to share with you. But most importantly, what I try to do is get everybody trained on that so-called lean launchpad i -Corps innovation core process because that really is what they're looking for. Um, and, and so that will help you immeasurably uh, in terms of putting together a, um, a good commercialization plan. So in a nutshell, they will provide you as, as part of uh, the a guide for submitting the proposal, the questions that they want you to answer. Not too helpful, quite frankly. Um, but um, for those of you who are interested, and, and, you know, Kelly, what the heck, I'm very happy just to ship it out to you and Elizabeth anyway, uh, just in case anyone's interested, just so they can take a peek at what um, a commercialization plan should look like. And, and it's basically just fill in the blanks. So that might be a, a good start. I wouldn't say it's going to be your complete commercialization plan, but if you're able to complete that template, you're probably well on your way. Uh, but then again, I, I highly recommend, and by the way, that program that, that you and I were just uh, talking about, that four-part series, does a deep dive into i -Corps as well. Well, fantastic information, Martin. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we're out of time. So for Martin Kleckner III and Elizabeth Hamlin, I'm Kelly Beard, and join us uh, in two weeks for our webinar on lines of credit. And we will see you then. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye now.